Um, Darwin was a very shy man, and he would have been appalled to be here tonight trying to speak to so many people. His favorite method of communicating was writing with a pen dipped in an ink well. Uh, and uh, you probably know that he had a slight stutter and, and wasn't very uh, good at expressing himself in speech, but in writing his expression was superb and very clear. So I hope to be as clear tonight as Darwin's writing is, and I want to uh, make you feel bad about yourselves because I'm trying to, I would try to give you an unpleasant feeling about what you are as humans. At the end of the talk, you'll just go back to feeling good about yourselves as normal, so don't worry. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is what we know about our position in the universe of life. So uh, as Darwin pointed out to us, Is there another point? Thank you, David. Yeah. The laser point is rather small, so I'll just have to describe it. As Darwin pointed out to us, we have a common uh, point in the tree of life, and so we have three major groups of life, the bacteria in blue, the archaea in the center, uh, single-celled organisms that uh, live in extreme environments, and the eukaryotes, uh, cellular organisms with nuclei, including you and me, on the right-hand side. Um, a long time ago, uh, we joined forces with a member of the group on the left-hand side, the bacteria, and a bacterium of some sort embedded itself, either was eaten by a eukaryote cell or was uh, joined forces in a more congenial way. Uh, and those, those bacteria are now in our cells, and they're called mitochondria. There are more of those in your cells than there are of your own cells. There are hundreds of mitochondria in your cells, depending on the time of day and the activity they're doing. They provide the power for all your cellular activities. And so without them, it would be impossible. So without a bacterium joining into a single cell very early in the stage of life, we wouldn't be here. So it's important to realize that we are made of conjoined organisms and we're not a single organism. Inside your gut, this is a photograph taken with a tube down someone's uh, throat. Inside your gut are billions of bacteria. There are 10 times more bacterial cells in you than your own cells. So what does that make you? Does it make you a bacterium or a colony of bacteria or a single human? You've only learned to be a single human very recently in your life. For the first year or so of your life, you didn't know you were a single human an entity that was individual and apart from your mother, you, that, that we're all, we all learn that. But what we really are is an ecosystem. We're a walking ecosystem that's made up of mitochondria that were formerly independent bacteria and our own eukaryotic cells that have come together in colonies, ecosystems of cells that form organs and so on, that for, come together to make an organism yourself that harbors an ecosystem of other organisms, in this case bacteria, and viruses. And of course, depending on the time of day and what you feel like, you've got more of those on you and in you than your own cells. And in fact, there are viruses in your own DNA. As much as 8% of your DNA is viral that's been acquired over geological time, and if we count, I'm not an expert on viruses, but if we count uh, stretches of DNA with a, with a retroviral mosaic, then, then we can estimate perhaps as much as 25% of a human's DNA is made of viruses that have got in there and are stuck there. So not even your DNA is your own. And if you have parasites in your ecosystem that you call yourself, like this tapeworm, then, of course, you've got the DNA of other organisms in you. So whatever louse or parasite you've got in your gut, then you're not a single individual. You're many individuals walking around this world. Right? So if you, if you try to think of yourself as an e a walking ecosystem rather than a single individual human, you get a much better view of your place in the universe than you do if you just think of me. OK, so I'm from Penn State, so I have to use the analogy for time as, as a football field. 
So on the right-hand side, that's when the Earth formed. So that's four, four and a half billion years ago. And you don't get the first signs of life until your own 40-yard line. And you don't get the first cell with a nucleus, even a single-celled organism, until the halfway line. You don't get anything that looks like a plant or an animal, something with structure, multicellular structure, until something like the 12-yard line before you score a, go a, tr a goal. And you don't get anything like a mammal until much later, the six-yard line, and primates are there at the one-yard line. And the first humans come in on the cuticle of the last blade of grass before you score the touchdown. So that puts you in your time perspective. We are very, very recent. As humans, we're very recent organisms in, in the sense that we can say we're independent organisms. Everything that you are interested in about being a human, except for ordinary bodily activities that you normally don't pay any attention to, everything you're interested in about humans is extremely recent in the fossil record and the archaeological record. Now, of course, you can tell from my accent that American football isn't my game. These two people, <laughs> the one on the right plays soccer, his name is David Beckham. And the one on the left is his good wife, Victoria Beckham, affectionately known in Britain as Thick and Thin. <laughs> and, I, and I put them up there as good examples of human beings. Right? So, so we all have characters, and, and I'll tell you how, old, how long it's, it has been since we've had those things. Two eyes. A backbone. Three semicircular canals. Jaws, four limbs, five digits, three ear ossicles on either side of our head, the same dental formula, that is the same number of teeth of different types, two incisors, a canine, two premolars, three molars, when you're an adult, and external testes. Gonads hanging in a small bag in the front of the male. 550 million years for two eyes. This 520 million years for a backbone, 470 million years for three semicircular canals, extremely ancient structures, 470 million years for jaws, 370 million years for four limbs, but get this, 300 million years for five digits. It took 70 million years to settle down to the number five, which is basic for mammals. The first vertebrates with digits had seven and eight as paddle-like structures, and they only settled down to five very late. It took 70 million years to, for that to settle down. Three ear ossicles, which mammals have, 130 million years, made up of parts of the jaw bones. Same dental formula, 35 million years and external testes, 90 million years. So you can see that the human body has been built up of different bits over a long period of geological time. We're not one integrated organism made all at once. Some parts are ancient and we share with other creatures. Some parts are more recent and we share them with a different set of creatures and so on until we find unique human things. So I'm going to talk about a couple of these just in detail. So external testes. Um, you probably know, if, if you're a, a fisherman or a hunter, that fish don't have external testes. And birds don't have external testes. If I asked all the medical students I'd taught in my life, why is it that humans have their gonads, male humans have their gonads hanging in a bag outside their body in a dangerous place, witness the football players at the free kick, <laughs> they would say, well, you know, the sperm can't uh, mature at the, at the core body temperatures. It has to mature at a cooler temperature, so it's kept outside the body in this silly little sack. And I'd say, well, that's true, but it isn't right. And the reason it isn't right is because the primitive condition of all vertebrates is that of fish, for the male and female gonads to be safe inside the body. It's still there in, most, in all reptiles and all birds, and birds are warm-blooded. In fact, their core body temperatures are higher than mine and yours. 
So it's nothing about temperature in that sense. And even more important, if we look at the way that we understand the, the groupings of mammals today, which is a very recent grouping, Darwin would not agree with this. He'd, have, he'd be told the wrong grouping in his time. We have a whole group of mammals that are color-coded here for you. We have a group of mammals at the, at the top left there called Afrotheria. They're animals as diverse as golden moles, little tiny creatures that live in sand dunes in Namibia, to tenrex, spiny hedgehog-like creatures that are not related to hedgehogs, to elephant shrews, little shrews with long noses, aardvarks, you know what they look like, elephants, manatees, and hyrexes. All these animals came from a single ancestor in Africa. None of them has external testings. Go to the game parks of Africa, take your binoculars and look at an elephant, you will not see any. They're mammals, they have warm temperature, right? A similar group of animals is in light blue to the top. They're called xenarthrans, armadillo sloths, and anteaters. None of those have external testes. In fact, both those groups of animals evolved in the southern continent of Gondwana, and they were isolated on those continents for a long, long time, but they retained the primitive mammal condition of having internal testes, and they have no problem maturing their sperm at an internal body temperature. The other groups of animals, the dark blue to the bottom, which includes humans, tree shrews, flying lemurs, chimps, squirrels, mouse, rodents, and rabbits, and things like that, and the other group in green, the Lorazithias, which includes bats and cows and horses and whales and hippos and all those things, they have external testes. And they have to mature their testes, except in a couple of ex exceptions I'll tell you about, they have to mature their testes at a cooler temperature and have them externally in a, in a, in a scrotum. There are a couple of really interesting exceptions to that. Uh, so those are the Gondwana land ones, the elephants and the xenarthrans, the Afrotheas and the xenarthrans. Whoops, sorry, I'll go back. But among the Lorazithias, there are two groups that have gone back to the water. They are whales and they are seals and the seal relatives. And those have got internal testes again. External testes in cold conditions in the water are, are not favorable and they interfere with swimming too. So those animals have testes that are internal. However, Whales cool their testes with a countercurrent heat exchanger in their dorsal fin, and seals do the same with a countercurrent heat exchanger in their flippers, their hind flippers. So these are animals that once had a scrotum with testes outside, but now have internalized it again. So the story of external testes is a complicated one, and it tells us straight away that we are not the group that started as mammals in Africa. Okay, so the, this is what molecular uh, relationships with using DNA will tell us about human relationships. So our, our closest living relatives, according to the genetic material that, that, that forms uh, us when we're, when we're uh, formed in, when an egg is fertilized, uh, that, that genetic material tells us that we are closest to chimpanzees, next closest to gorillas, then orangs, then gibbons, and then old world monkeys. And those are rough guesses about when those splitting, to, splitting events occurred. So now about human evolution. Darwin thought, like most people, that we're all an integrated thing, that it all happens at once. He said, oh, once we stood on our hind legs, that freed the hands from the job of doing locomotion, and that meant we could manipulate things like tools and weapons that would have a positive feedback on, on, on our brains and we'd get big brains. And he was wrong. We know he's wrong because we have fossils that show we're bipedal for four million years before our brains enlarged. Right? So the positive feedback either wasn't there or didn't make any difference. We were bipedal apes for four million years before any brain enlargement. So that's, see, even Darwin, who was a very clever and thoughtful man, could get tricked into thinking that everything was packaged together, whereas I've just tried to show you that some of these parts are extremely ancient and other parts are extremely new. And he couldn't know which parts were which because he had no fossil record. So I can't blame the poor guy. Okay, so if you stopped me in the cafeteria at lunchtime and said, what's the story of human evolution? This is what I draw on a napkin. So... You can see at the bottom, I've put some time there, six million years about to today, and one million year time slices. 
And there's a thing called LCA at the bottom. That's the last common ancestor between chimps and humans. So we split from chimps somewhere around about 6 million years ago. And those first bipedal apes were bipedal on the human lineage. They were bipedal. And we don't know too much about them. We, they, we know that their teeth had fairly thin enamel, like chimpanzees do, and that gradually, over the course of, of uh, four million years, they, these bipedal apes got bigger teeth and thicker enameled teeth. And since most of the fossil record is, is scraps, there are, we have hundreds, if not thousands, of pieces of fossils for this record of individual animals, but most of them are just a bit of tooth or jaw. I'm going to tell you the story of human evolution by showing you some of the better finds, the more significant finds, just because I want to show you that there are some really good pieces of evidence. But remember that between the really good pieces of evidence, there are thousands and thousands of little bits and pieces that you can use to do other studies on. So at about somewhere around about uh, three million years ago, our lineage split into two. And one group of bipedal apes became extremely big-toothed. These creatures have such big teeth that you could put five human molars on top of one of theirs. But they still had small ape-sized brains, and they became extinct about one million years ago. So it's a sad thing that we don't even have in a zoo today one of these bipedal apes that would look something like a funny flat-faced gorilla. The other lineage that, that split at the time they went the opposite way, and they developed small teeth, and instead of, small, instead of big teeth, they had tooth substitutes. They had stone tools. So the first stone tools occur at about two and a half million years ago. And at the same time, commensurate with that, there's a brain size increase. So we start getting smaller teeth, and the teeth are replaced in their function by tools, as Darwin predicted. And at that time, about two million years ago, something happened that enabled these first small-toothed, big-brained, bigger-brained apes to get out of Africa for the first time. So they get out of Africa and they turn up in Eurasia. That's the first out of Africa. Uh, that lineage continues, and there's a second out of Africa around 100,000 years to 200,000 years ago with a second brain size increase and the origin of modern human cultures and symbolism. And out of that second out of Africa, together with the people that led to that second out of Africa, all of us have come. So all of us are Africans. Until very recently, uh, we were all Africans. Okay, so these are the names that people put on them over this six million years. I'm going to show you some fossils of some of them. Uh, the early ones we don't know too much about. Uh, Sahel Anthropus is named for the Sahel. That, that strip of Africa, uh, south of the Sahara Desert and north of the steppes of Africa. Aurorian is known uh, from some scraps of fossils in Kenya. Ardipithecus is known from a complete skeleton that hasn't been published yet, and we're hoping to see that published this year. Uh, but it's also known from some, some other fossils. And then we have something called Australopithecus, and I'm including in there quite a lot about. And then our own genus Homo appears on the scene about two and a half million years ago, and then the, the fossil rec record gradually increases until uh, in fairly recent times when people started burying each other, either for good housekeeping or um, for symbolic reasons. Uh, then the archaeological record takes over and we, we get lots and lots of fossils once you start burying each other and they're not scavenged. Okay, so the earliest decent fossil we have is a distorted skull from the center of Africa in the nation of Chad, found by Michel Brunet from the Collège de France. And uh, as you can see, it's a crushed and squashed skull, which needs much computer reconstructing to make sense of it. It has an ape-sized brain. It has a relatively small canine. And if you can believe the, the squashing hasn't affected it too much, then it looks as though the hole in the base of the skull where our spinal cord joins the brain the medulla oblongata goes through the skull there. It looks far forward, and that's a human characteristic, a bipedal characteristic. And if that's true, then these animals were bipedal. These are fossils on the left from Aurorin. You can see scraps of jaws and teeth, but some femur bones, some thigh bones. And people claim those thigh bones say these were bipedal animals. And walking bipedally in, in, is a unique human trait in mammals. 
As someone famously said, humans are unfeathered bipeds. The, the things on the right are called Ardipithecus, and you can see bits of limb bones and isolated teeth and bits of ear bones and the base of the skull. And there's lots more published, as I said, a complete skeleton is, is known of this thing but hasn't been published yet. Again, the base of the skull, if we can tell from the two ear bones at the bottom, and you can see the frame of magnum again for the uh, medulla, um, that is far forward in the skull, and so it's highly likely that these things are bipedal too. So that's the sort of evidence there. Now, Australopithecus, we know lots about, and the first one was found in the 1920s. And it's this beautiful little skull that was collected in South Africa, and it was found by uh, miners who were blasting for limestone. They were blasting the limestone out of a series of de cave deposits, and, and they blasted out this little skull, and you can see the pale bones of the skull and the white teeth of a baby. It's just getting its first molars in, and in the back of the skull, you can see what is the infilling of the brain case. So we have a natural cast of the inside of the skull. And you can see the, the sulci and gyri on the brain, the grooves and fissures of the brain, and the blood vessels of the meninges of the brain. When it was discovered in, in South Africa, the Piltdown fossil still held people's attention in Europe. And uh, work in South Africa was perceived to be done by colonists way off there who didn't know anything. And the scene of action was London and the, the medical schools in London. So it was dismissed as just being a small ape. In fact, his name, Australopithecus, means the southern ape, and Africanus means Africa, the southern ape of Africa. So uh, the, the things were interrupted at this time because of the Second World War, and, and fossil collecting took a back seat. But there was one man who wanted to know what an adult Australopithecus would look like. Because you, as you all know, Juvenile mammals look more like each other than adult mammals do. So a juvenile chimpanzee looks much more like a baby, a human baby, than an adult chimpanzee looks like a human adult. And that's because babies have relatively big brains. You get most of your brain early on in your life, and your faces are short because when babies are weaned onto adult foods, they have to eat adult foods, and so their faces are short for better mechanical advantage to eat adult foods. So that's why baby chimps look more like humans than than adult chimps. So there's one man who was in a hurry to find out uh, what an adult Australopithecus would look like, and he was a, in a hurry because he was 80 years old. And his name was Robert Broom. There he is. And so he took sticks of dynamite, drilled holes in these caves, and blasted out big pieces of cave. And on his first blast, he broke right through the skull of an adult Australopithecus. And so you can see on the piece of rock that he, he's picked up from where it flew, there's the inside of the top of the skull, and he's pointing with his left index finger at the inside of this skull. It's got no rock inside the, the brain case. And that's the skull at the top. And we have many more from those caves now. People have been working uh, since the 1940s in those caves, taking all the cave rock out and dissolving it in acid and getting all the bones out. And we have dozens and dozens of skulls and partial skeletons of these things. Nearby caves from a slightly different time period produced big-toothed forms, like the one on the bottom, uh, which are sometimes put in their own separate group, Paranthropus. And these are Australopithecus-like creatures, bipedal apes with huge teeth. And those huge teeth needed large muscles to, to drive them. So the temporalis muscle that you can see on the si feel on the side of your head, they would have had about a pound of steak on each side of their head to drive these enormous teeth and jaws. So that was the lineage that became extinct. So one of the best known specimens of Australopithecus didn't come from caves in Africa. Remember, in order to become a fossil in the museum, if you want to be in the Carnegie someday as a specimen, first of all, you have to die. And secondly, you have to get buried. If you're left out on, on the, the open air, you, you'll be scavenged by scavengers, even in Pittsburgh. And, and, and you'll, you, you'll be ruined by bacteria and plants and roots and things like that. You have to get buried, and you can either get buried by somebody digging a hole for you and burying you, which is extremely late in our story, or you can get buried by sediment. And the sediment occurs in places like the Rift Valley, where stuff gets washed downhill and becomes sediment. So you have to be buried in lake sediments or river sediments or cave sediments. These sediments here, you can see those horizontal layer cake strata are in the Hadar region of the Rift Valley in Ethiopia. 
and uh, it's a perfect place to find fossils, including uh, fossil humans. And the two people on the left that standing with the hat on is Don Johansson, who now works at the University at Arizona State University, and Tom Gray. And what he's wrapping up in toilet paper is parts of a little skeleton that's washing out down this hill. Um, when they got back to camp, the guys in camp were playing the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. So they called the skeleton Lucy. And so there's the, the, the pieces of the skeleton they got. And I think that Lucy is still on display in the United States at the moment in a touring exhibit of Ethiopian artifacts and, uh, and, and archaeology. Uh, it's, it's often said, in fact it was said in this, lo this last month's National Geographic magazine, that it's 40% of a skeleton. Well, you know, when you give numbers, it's ever so easy to check. And it's not 40%, it's something like 20%. So I asked Don, Don, how did you get 40%? He said, well, I discounted the fact we've got no hands and feet, because we never found those bones except a couple of them, and I mirror image things. So if we had one, I thought that that would do for the other one, since we're symmetrical. So it's only about 20% of a human, of a, of a bipedal ape. But we have lots of other individuals from this site, including about 10 individuals that were, somehow got themselves into the same place in the ground. Uh, and and, and now, uh, just recently, a complete beautiful baby skeleton. The baby has, is just getting its, third mold, its, its, tr its first molars in. It's got all its whole skeleton in its little rib cage and its hands and feet and so on are found. It's, th it's three and a half million years old. In South Africa, these three people have just been part of a wonderful recent story. So, so the man in the back is Ron Clark. He's a Brit who works in South Africa. And Ron had found some bones in the museum. One of the best places to excavate is museum drawers from old collections. You find extraordinary stuff in there that was misplaced or misidentified in the first place. Anyway, he found some little bones that had been labeled fossil monkey from one of these caves in South Africa, and he recognized that they were from a tiny bipedal ape of the size of Lucy. So he knew, since the label said so, that the fossils came from a cave that nobody had looked for fossils in. It had been mined and all the limestone taken out, the stalactite, stalagmite. So he got these two people who are expert fossil finders, Stephen Otsuki and, and Kwame Molefe, and he gave them the casts. And he said, go down to that cave with lots of lamps and find and see if you can find where they broke off the cave. Maybe the rest of it's in the cave. So they did, and they, you can see now the casts are sticking on the cave wall there, and then Ron chiseled in into this solid rock, and there are the lower limbs going in, and then the two knee joints going across. And he carried on, and they found the skull with an arm bone right next to it, and then away from the skull, over at the top left, a complete beautiful Australopithecus hand, every little bone intact, folded over. So Ron is taking his great care to take out this skeleton very carefully, Every time he exposes a bit of the skeleton, he takes a replica of it and photographs of it and so on. And if you want to see this, in the American Museum of Natural History, there is a cast of, part of one stage of Ron's excavation of this wonderful skeleton. It's a complete undistorted skull. The lower jaw is still on, on it, as you can see. And there's no rock inside the brain case. They put a medical scope on the inside and looked inside. So there's a complete Australopithecus that will be out for us to study soon. We already knew that Australopithecus was bipedal from isolated bones, like this bone in the middle. Uh, the bone on the right is the knee joint of a human, so it's like my right knee. And when I take my left leg off the floor, my foot is still under my body weight because my knee angles. My, my hips are out here, my femur angles in, and it makes an angle with my tibia, the lower bone in the leg. So you see that strong angle, it's called the carrying angle, and it's characteristic of bipedal creatures. The one on the left there, on your right, is a chimpanzee, and chimpanzees don't walk bipedal in there. Their thigh bone is directly on top of their tibia, so it doesn't have that angle. The bone in the middle, the two bones in the middle are an Australopithecus, and that carrying angle is even stronger than in humans, because Australopithecus is these bipedal apes, their legs were shorter than ours, and their hips were wider. And if we didn't believe the anatomy and the deductions from anatomy, we've got footprints. So Mary Leake's team, working at this site in Tanzania a number of years ago, f 
found these footprints. There are footprints of many animals, and they were coming just after a volcanic ash fall. Now, when a volcano puddles out the volcanic ash, the ash particles act as nuclei for raindrops, and it comes down as a sort of muddy rain. And it's extremely sticky and covers everything. And the animals that walked across this did so very carefully. So what you, where you can see the man brushing, there are two individuals, one walking in the steps of another. So the ones on the right are double prints, a big individual with a smaller individual stepping exactly in the footprints of the other. And then to the left of it is a smaller individual walking alongside. In reconstruction, you often see a, a male bipedal ape walking along with his arm around a female bipedal ape, but the two prints are too close together for that. They must have been walking one ahead of the other or behind the other. Coming in the other direction are the tracks of two three-toed horses, hipparians. So we have direct proof that these were bipeds walking, and they have no grasping big toe that stuck out like a chimpanzee if a chimpanzee makes prints on wet mud. Okay, so summarize then for about the bipedal apes that we call Australopithecus. They had ape-sized brains. They were upright and bipedal. They were very sexually dimorphic. That is, the males were much bigger in body size than the females, like gorillas are today, not like humans or chimpanzees. They had limb proportions that were not like humans. Their arms were much too long and the legs were too short. They had a very broad pelvis and a wide rib cage. They had very large cheek teeth and very thick tooth enamel, much larger than modern humans. And they had fast growth rates, and I'll tell you how I know that in a minute. And because of that, they had short life history periods. They grew up fast and died young, like African apes, not like humans. They didn't have the trick of elongating their life to having long periods. And I'll talk about that later. And they were probably all over Africa, but we only have them where there is sediment. So we don't know them where there's not sediment. And they lived from at least 4.5 million years ago as Australopithecuses to about 1 million years ago when the big toothed ones went extinct. Now, the earliest signs of our own genus, which we believe came out of the smaller branch of the Australopithecus lineage, occur at about 2.5 million years ago, and we have some scrappy fossils. And the one on the left is one of those scraps. It's the palate, a maxilla of an early homo, and it doesn't look like the long, ape-like palates of Australopithecus. And it comes from the very same site that has those things in it on the right-hand side. And those are chipped rocks that archaeologists called stone tools. And some of them are pebbles that have been pounded and pounded and pounded and bashed around. And others are pebbles that have had chips taken off and made sharp little flakes. And others are cobbles that have been bashed on points. Around about two million years ago, it's quite clear that we have two different types of creature living and dying side by side in the sediments of East Africa. So, for instance, in one geological bed, these two creatures, these two skulls have been found by Richard Leake's team at Lake Turkana in Kenya. So the one on the left is one of these big-toothed Australopithecuses, and you can see that it has a crest on the top of its skull for the attachment of these big temporal muscles. And you can see that its brain size is relatively small. This particular individual that's lost its teeth from erosion, but we have many more complete ones with beautiful teeth that show that these, these had massive teeth and jaws. And the one on the right, as you can see, looks much more like a human skull. In fact, it's a human skull with a, a brain size of about 800 milliliters. So that's about the size of a, the brain of a one-year-old human child, or twice the brain of an adult chimpanzee depending on which way you want to spin it. And you can see that there's not much chewing muscle on that. So the one on the left is an eating machine, and the one on the right is a thinking machine. So on the, these ones on the left became extinct about a million years ago when modern African faunas got, got in from Europe, and the one on the right persisted. In fact, it was the f this is a representative of the first group of bipedal hominids to get out of Africa. And why did they get out of Africa? Why did the Australopithecus stay in Africa? Well, if you're a plant-eating animal, the, the plants don't have much choice. They can't run away. So plants not having legs devise all sorts of, of protective mechanisms, like po being poisonous, or having thorns, or spiky bits, or leaves full of silica, all sorts of tricks that plants have uh, to avoid being eaten, not just by 
humans and mammals, but by insects, the, their main predators and nematodes and things like that. If you're a, a, a plant-eating animal, you have to have physiological and behavioral uh, lessons to learn to eat those plants. And you, they're stuck with them. So w wherever the plants are, that's where you're stuck. Once you become a carnivore and you eat meat, then meat is meat. Mammal meat is the same whether it's in South America or Australia or China or London or Pittsburgh. Steak is steak and it's digested just the same way. So but being carnivorous enables you to spread out across the planet to eat meat and that's what they did. We know quite a lot about these creatures. This is the first out of Africa expansion of early hominids. And uh, one of the reasons we know a lot is because of, of a found, find that was made in Lake Turkana in, about, uh, in, in, the, in the 1980s. My friend Kimoya Kimau, uh, who's found more fossil hominids than anybody else, uh, called on the radio to Richard Leakey and me and said, I found a piece of Homo erectus skull. We call these things Homo erectus. And uh, so he had, and his, when we got to camp, that was the piece he was showing us. And there's Kimoya. Uh, loosening the soil where he'd found this piece of skull. And I'm sitting behind, and Meave Leakey is sitting behind, and we're just loosening the topsoil to find any more pieces of, of this skull that he'd found. If you notice, there's a, Kamoya's got a little thorn tree near his right foot, and uh, that thorn tree was getting in the way, and I was urging Leakey to cut it down because I was catching my shirt and my hair in it, and it was a nuisance, but we didn't. And then when we got down to the bedrock, just under the loose soil, we started finding these things, and these are ribs. And you probably don't know, but human ribs are delicious. They're crunchy, and you can eat them easily because they're full of marrow. It's one, in, in adults, it's one of the few places where you're still making red blood cells in your vertebral column and your ribs and your sternum. Anyway, they, if, you, if you put a dead human out on the African savanna, it would, the lions, the jackals, will, and the vultures will get it. So here are these ribs, which we'd never seen before. And as we carried on digging, all of a sudden, Leek is pointing to the National Geographic photographer, and he's pointing to his face, saying, I found the face of this skull. And I'm, I don't know the technical term for this, but the skull had germinated in the only wet place in the desert, which was an upside-down Homo erectus skull. And the plant grew down, and it split the skull, and we'd already found the brain case bits, and the face skeleton was in that part of the plant that's in the soil, but before the roots start. And I don't know if there's a technical name for that. So after that, we carried on digging, and there you can see Kamoya Kimo in the top and Wambuel Mangao, one of our guys, digging down to get to this layer. There's Leakey. He's, look, he's digging on a mandible, and I'm digging on a tibia and so on. So after a, a year or two of digging, whoops, this is how much we had of a single Homo erectus skeleton, and I'm standing next to it there. And that's 40% of a, of a Homo erectus skeleton, which is why I bothered to call Don, Don Johansson and ask him how he got 40%, because as you can see, we got much more than Lucy. Right? But it's only 40% because we've only got two or three hand and foot bones. All those tiny little bones washed away. This, this individual died. We can reconstruct his, his, his place of death very accurately. He died. We don't know how he died. He'd had a tough life. He had a bad injury, a, a traumatic injury that crushed one of his discs in his back that made him slightly crooked and asymmetrical. He, he was dead, and he was in a shallow lake and he was bobbing in the water as the ripples came through, and catfish and snails sucked on him, and he gradually dissolved, and his soft tissues rotted, and he dropped all the straight-rooted teeth, that's how I know his head was bobbing in one place, all the incisors and canines, upper and lower jaws together, came out and landed in a hippo footprint. Then these, the hippos and antelopes and catfish sucked on him, and, and he, all the bones got kicked further and further to the shore, and all the tiny bones drifted further and further, and we never found those because that part was eroded before we found them. The, the erosion gully had taken those away. So, but in any case, you can see we can get the full proportions of this individual. We know how big his brain is, and we had one surprise, and that is, uh, I, I don't know whether you can see that little red dot there, but that tooth there is his milk canine. Right? Now, the milk canine... Is, is, is one of your teeth that you lose fairly late, it comes through. As you know, when you give a tooth to the tooth fairy, it doesn't have a root on it, right? It just is the crown. So before you lose a tooth, a milk tooth, 
the roots resorb. And the roots resorb in a complicated interaction with the crown of the permanent tooth that's pushing up under it. So a milk molar has a premolar, a bicuspid pushing under it. The milk canine has a permanent canine. And the roots of this, these two permanent canines were so slender and tiny that they, this tooth would have got to that maddening stage where it, it wobbled all the time. When he bit, it would have felt funny, but it was too tightly tied in so you couldn't pull it out. Do you remember that stage of your milk teeth? That's where it was. So uh, he also had this tooth at the back, and that's just erupted, and dentists call that the 12-year tooth. So in modern human terms, he's 12 years old, but look how big he is. Right? He's way up to my shoulder, and he doesn't have much brain. He only has 800 milliliters. That's as much brain as a one-year-old human has, right? as an adult. Okay, so we know a lot of his body proportions and so on. As you can see, he looks like a human with a small brain. Okay, now the archaeologists tell us, and I don't know much about archaeology, but this is, these are the broken bones from one of Mary Leakey's sites from this two million year period. And these are smashed bones. And they're covered in cut marks made by stone tools. And you can distinguish stone tools from, uh, from other marks, like tooth marks of carnivores and hyenas, very easily. And so these creatures, these early Homo erectus, were smashing animal bones up. They were into catching animals or scavenging animals, and they were breaking the bones up for the marrow, which is full of fat. And they were eating the meat off it, cutting the meat off it, right? So they were, they were carnivores, and they were knocking off really big animals. And that's why we know that these were carnivorous bipedal apes much more carnivorous than any other primate today except the tiny tarsia that lives on insects and lizards. So it's a very strange shift in our strategy, strategy for being on the planet. And becoming a carnivore, you can have several predictions about what it will do to your ecology and behavior. One is your populations will crash. Because if you move up the pyramid of life, the eating pyramid, and go up to the top, you by definition have to have fewer than the ones underneath. So for instance, uh, the, the plants on the planet get about 10% out of the sun's energy that they can convert from all the energy they get. The cow that eats the plants only gets 10% of the plant's energy on the transfer of energies. We eat the cow, we get 10%. So the lion eats us, it gets 10%, and so on. So there's 90% lost about in every energy transfer as you go up the feeding pyramid. And so, you can't have large numbers and you can't have high population densities. But you can have a huge species range because meat is meat. And you can get a fair idea of that because in, 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 in recent recorded history, lions are present from Cape Town at the southern tip of Africa all the way across Europe and all the way to the coast of China. So big carnivores can have enormous home ranges, the same species. Okay, so I mentioned before about you having, some of you having tapeworms, and uh, the tapeworms can come into our story. Um, this is a molecular phylogeny, the molecular relationships of tapeworms, done by a group uh, from Beltsville, uh, the U.S. Agricultural Station. And what they found is, uh, they found that if you, if you look to see, what, whoops, sorry, if you look to see what the closest uh, relative of the human tapeworm is, there are three human tapeworms, and one is the, its closest relative is a tapeworm that infects hyenas and African hunting dogs, and two others that are closely related are, have, have the next closest relationship to the tapeworm that infests lions. So this tells us that we don't get tapeworms from our domesticated animals. We got our tapeworms a long time ago by eating the same antelopes and pigs, and so on, that lions, hunting dogs, and hyenas ate a long time ago in Africa. And you can do some estimates of how long it takes to, for these, these, these molecules, DNA molecules, to diverge, and their answer has very large errors on it, but it's somewhere around about two million years ago, and that fits perfectly with our story. So even our parasites can give us information about our past behavior. Now, we know they got out of Africa because of some beautiful new fossils in the Republic of Georgia. And they come from a site just there, uh, south of the capital, Tbilisi. And uh, the, the site is, is 
in an archaeological site. As you can see, those are stone walls. The hominid excavation is under that blue tarpaulin. And the walls are part of a medieval village. And uh, as I told you, I don't know much about archaeology, but I'm told that archaeologists love to dig in ancient latrines because people get rid of stuff down ancient latrines. And so they were digging down ancient latrines in these, this medieval village, and they came across a saber-toothed tiger skeleton. And when they rolled the saber-toothed tiger skeleton over, there was a human jaw underneath it and some stone tools. So they'd gone down through the medieval layers, and they were in layers that are now dated by the potassium argon method to 1.78 million years ago. About 2 million, as far as you and I are concerned. And they've got lots of fossils. Here you can see one of the skulls uh, coming out of this little excavation. They've only excavated about as much as this little platform here. And they've got many human specimens as well as lots of other animal specimens. They've got this amount of a single male skeleton. Okay, so we've got a series of skulls from this site of Daminese. They look just like the specimens we've had from Africa at the same period. These are the out of Africa one the two million year expansion when our ancestors became extremely carnivorous and took on a new role on the planet, that of becoming one of the top carnivores. And we left our herbivore past behind for a while. Now I'm going to digress uh, just about uh, some points on locomotion. Inside this chimpanzee skull there are some cavities. And the biggest of the cavity is the brain case, of course, and there are sinuses that you know, fill up with snot when you have a cold and so on in the, the face. Um, but there are some cavities at the back that I've taken the skull away in this computer so that you can see the three semicircular canals on one side. They're joined next to a little spiral organ, which is the organ of hearing. And those three semicircular canals are very important. As you now know, you've had them since you've had jaws over half a billion years. So those, or, those organs have functioned well over half a billion years, and what they do is they are the receptors for the eye and neck reflexes that keep your vision steady as you move through the world. And my colleagues and I have done a big study, comparative study that's been validated by neurophysiological experiments to show that what they do is to keep your retinal image st steady so your brain doesn't have to work hard at a jerky image as you move through the world. This is especially critical for animals that fly, and for animals that leap through trees in a quick way. So you, you're not at all surprised to know that gibbons, that are acrobatic creatures that fly through the trees, that have large canals for their body size, that peregrine falcons that fly at 200 miles an hour have large canals for their size, and you won't be at all surprised to know that sloths that hardly move at all and come down once a week from the trees to defecate have tiny canals, and that chickens have tiny canals. So we could look at the canals in a fossil, by putting them in a CT scanner and then imaging the, the semicircular canals, and we can see how they look to affect locomotion. So there's a great, great ape semicircular canal system on the left and a human on the right. And the two canals that are involved in jerky motion up and down, like this when I walk, they're enlarged in humans. The little lateral canal is shrunk in humans because we don't sway left and right much when we walk. And so the great apes have smaller canals, and of course they don't have such fast jerky locomotion as we do. And we can look at fossils, and there again I've just joined the human great ape comparison. I've put on one of these big bipedal apes, these robust Australopithecuses, and it has the same canals as an ape of its size. So they didn't have a human jerky-like locomotion. If we'd managed to keep one, if they hadn't gone extinct and we had one in the zoo today, we'd see that it had a chimpanzee-like locomotion in speed and jerkiness, but it was bipedal. I don't have a reconstruction of Homo erectus to show you, but on this graph, I've plotted the canal size against body mass. We have to normalize for body mass. But these are various primates, mouse lemurs here to gorillas up here. And there's Homo sapiens, and that's Homo erectus, right on the Homo sapiens. These are the two Australopithecuses, and these, little, these four little uh, circles are the living great apes chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and orangs. So Australopithecus had, had locomotion that was slow and non-jerky. And ours, by Homo erectus time, two million years ago, we'd already got this fast locomotion, which we need for catching antelopes and throwing rocks at them. Okay. 
So I said I'd tell you about how I knew that these creatures grew up, slow, grew up uh, quickly and died young. And so this is a famous diagram by, by a primatologist, Adolf Schultz, from Zurich. And what it shows is the various periods of life for uh, a, a lemur, a macaque, a gibbon, a chimp, and a human. And humans live a lot longer. There's 70 years up there. And, uh, and, and it shows a, a gestation period and then a juve, an infantile period, a juvenile period. And, and we have an extra period in here uh, called adolescence that the great apes don't have. Adolescence is a period of uh, sexual activity, but fortunately not great fertility. And it's unique to humans. Uh, and, uh, and so we, the, that, that, that lengthening of all of our life history periods uh, is, is, leads to a lot of, of compensatory effects in human behavior, as you all know, especially those of you who've got adolescent or had adolescent children. So here's some data that, that I can show you uh, about how every primate but humans grow up. So what here is shown uh, a graph which shows brain weight against body weight for rhesus macaques. And these are dead embryos, dead fetuses, dead macaque babies, and dead macaque juveniles. And so what you can see is from conception, where the brain doesn't weigh anything and the body doesn't weigh anything, the brain grows quite rapidly up to this period about when you've got about half your brain as a macaque, you've got 50 grams, and, and at birth your brain growth slows down and you get the rest of your brain growth over the next few years when, as you grow up. That's how every primate, including chimps and gorillas, grow up. Now I'm going to show you the same data for humans. This is the brain weight on the left, and there's the body weight on the right, and these are dead human embryos, these are dead human fetuses, these are dead human babies. This is birth, so we're born with something like 400 grams, and then we carry on growing for the first year until we get 800 grams. So we double our birth weight in the first year of brain weight. So in our first year, we grow our brain like it's a fetus, and only then did we stop, and then we grow the last third of our brain and up until you're about five or six years old. Then you've got as much brain as you'll ever have. More neurons, in fact, but as much brain volume. So the great uh, Swiss zoologist Adolf Portman pointed out years ago, these are some of his data augmented by others, he pointed out years ago that every mammal that he knows, except humans, have respond, they have the same sort of locomotion as the adults at birth. So when a horse is born, it's only an hour or two before it's running around like a horse. When a dolphin slips out of mum and is born, it swims like a dolphin. Humans are the only primate, the only mammal that comes out and they don't do anything. <laughs> they have no, uh, nothing like an adult locomotion. In fact, they can't even turn over. At the same time, animals that are, that normal mammals are born and they respond to and give vocalizations that are very much like the adult's vocalizations. But humans don't. Humans don't start to talk until they're about one year old. They don't start to walk until they're about one year old. So it's as if humans have a gestation period of 32 months, 21 months, of 21 months, at nine months inside and a year outside. So it's a 21 month gestation period. It's, it's as though we're, we're still growing at fetal rates for a year after birth. And for that reason, I think that our first year of life is perhaps the most important because our motor skills are hopeless, as everybody knows. But we're outside the womb now for that first year of life. Our brain is growing at fetal rates, and we're now bombarded by sensations that, that fetuses aren't subjected to in any other mammal. I mean, yes, I'm sure a fetus can hear some sound through the uterine wall, and it must be a nice, dull, throbbing sound. It can hear mother's heartbeats and all that stuff. And it certainly, can't, it certainly can taste and smell its own urine as it urinates into its amniotic fluid and, and swallows it to get its digestive and urinary tracts going late in, in fetal life. So it tastes things, but it's its own taste. And it doesn't smell anything because its nose is blocked up with amniotic fluid and, it, and so on, right? So it, it has none, and it doesn't see anything, right? So now we've got a fetus outside that's bombarded by all these sensory information. I think that's a lot to do with what makes us human. It's a very special condition. 
So we can ask, when did that trick occur? When did humans start doing that? Having an infant that's hopeless in its motor skills, but its sensory skills are all turned on. It's a sensory sink. That's a very strange thing to do. We can put on that line what it would be if that's a Homo erectus. So that's a Homo erectus. If a Homo erectus could be born with a 400 gram brain, it could double it like any other primate, and it would get 800 grams, 800 milliliters, and that would be what an adult Homo erectus had. So Homo erectus need not have had that trick. OK, so now I can tell you something about how I know how old fossils are. When you grow your teeth, you calcify them. They're made of calcium phosphate, but, but basically. And you do it on a daily rhythm. Like every other the metabolism goes up and down during the day and night, and your growth increases and decreases during the day and night, according to rhythms. And those rhythms are recorded in your teeth. If you still have your teeth, you still have a record of your tooth growth in them. We could use special microscopes or x-ray sources to see them. And if I take a cross-section of a tooth and I can point out these little tiny blips, these are the tracks of a single enamel-forming cell as it made the, dent, the enamel here. And those little blips are a daily record of growth. And using some quite simple uh, microscope techniques, we can count those daily increments. We, we can count when you're born, because until you're born, your mother's metabolism buffers you from the daily up and down. So the enamel that's formed isn't, is prismless. It's got, it doesn't have these little daily increments. When you're born, it's a terrible shock to you, and you stop growing for about a week as mum takes to form your teeth. Okay? So we've done that for a whole bunch of, of animals. We used to cut them up, and now we can use X-ray phase contrast microscopy and not cut them up. But this is enamel thickness and enamel formation time. So the steepness of this slope means if this slope is sleep, steep like these australopiths, that's fast growth. If it's slow like this blue line, that's slow growth, and that's humans. Here are some early homos, and they're right on the African ape line. So early humans grew their teeth at the, at the fast rate of African apes and not like the slow rate of humans. So we can extrapolate this, and we know that uh, when we take that single individual, this is the, the, the Homo erectus skeleton I showed you that we found at Lake Turkana. This is the information we have about it from these first teeth. We actually haven't cut that tooth, those teeth up because the curators at the museum won't let us, but we can use some external features to, to find those, those little lines on the outside of the teeth, and we can extrapolate, and they fall right in Australopithecus uh, and, and the big tooth Australopithecus times, and not at all like modern animals are to the left. So that, that boy, I told you that in human terms, with his dental eruption, he was 12 years old. We now know exactly how old he was when he died. He was seven and a half. But he was already this tall. Right? So he was growing up really fast, and he was going to die young. In fact, he did die at seven and a half. But all Homo erectuses lived, grew up fast and died young. So they didn't have the trick of extending each part of life history and, and, as we do. Okay, so um, I, I started off the human evolution part of this by showing the front of Michelangelo's David. Uh, Stanford University has used a laser scanner to go all round, and they've had a virtual David project. And this, you can find this on the web if you go to Stanford University Virtual David. And you all know what's hanging down his back, right? It's a sling, right? And the sling is used, in his case, to kill another human. But uh, throwing... I believe, has been a major part of human evolution in order to, to catch a prey. And then, of course, we now throw other things. Apart from, from weapons for catching prey, we throw th weapons to damage other humans, and now we throw atom bombs. So these are things that, that really we associate with humans. When I said that the, the, the things that you all care about apart from basic physiological things like digestion and reproduction and stuff like that, things that go wrong when you have to go to the doctor that you don't normally care any about, you don't notice about, you, about your things. All the things you care about, the social things, the artistic things, the language things, the musical things, everything like that is extremely late. And we know from the fossil record that things like this, uh, oops, sorry, the Great Hall of Bulls in, in Lascaux Cave in France, which is only 26,000 years old or something like that, was painted by people. 
you can see that, I mean, that's not painted by a bipedal ape, it's painted by humans. And uh, if you look at these shells here on the left from South African caves at, at uh, 80,000 years old, these are shells that have been perforated, and you can see that they've, they've rubbed on a string, and someone had them around their neck. It was a necklace, right? So only humans decorate them. No, no bowerbirds do crazy things, but only humans decorate their skin. These pieces of ochre now, uh, here, this is a piece of red ochre from a cave. Some of these pieces now 100,000 years old. Um, they're scratched with geometrical figures, and they've been rubbed to put ochre on themselves, like many people in Africa still do today in other parts of the world. The Maasai, for instance, used that red ochre mixed with grease for tourism purposes. Um, and, uh, domestication of animals. All domestication that is, is extremely late in the last 10,000 years, apart from dogs, which are a bit earlier. But even that is very recent. This skull uh, is 160,000 years old, and it's been carried around in a net or a bag or a skin bag because it's polished from it. And that comes from Ethiopia. It's 160,000 years old. We have 100,000-year-old fish harpoons, carved fish harpoons. All of these things you can see are human things. Nobody would deny it, right? But there's nothing like this early in the record. You can't look at these chipped pebbles and say they're made by a human. You know, chimpanzees use rocks to crush nuts and things like that. So everything that modern humans care about in their daily lives, in their art and language and music and domestication and food habits and industry, everything is extremely late. And so um, if, if, we, if we had to give the, the, big, the big message about what we learn about human evolution that Darwin didn't know is we've evolved bits of ourselves at different times, so there hasn't been a little human plop down. It's, we've had fish-like things and reptile-like things and eight-fingered things and so on, and we've ended up at, by accident where our males have uh, their gonad hanging out in a dangerous position. Uh, we could equally well have come from the other side by accident and then we'd have had our gonad safely inside our, the males of our species. But it didn't, just by historical accident. And, and then only something happened, something crazy happened around about 200,000 years ago and that set off a second out of Africa and all modern humans come out of those Africans. All this early stuff with ochre and shells and harpoons comes from Africa. And molecular analyses of human DNA shows that diaspora of all humans spreading right out across the world with these cultures that were first started in Africa. It wasn't an explosion of cultures. We have an order in which decorations and utilitarian and domesticated cultures and plant and animals domestications occurred. It wasn't one single explosion, a creative explosion but it's all in the blink of an eye as far as a paleontologist is concerned. So thanks, and I'd be happy to take any questions.